John Dewey was just beginning to get comfortable in his grave when the Russians of all people reached down and stuck a spear into his heart. It was 1957. Dewey had died five years earlier, secure in the knowledge that he was America's preeminent education philosopher. And then the Russians launched Sputnik 1. As Walter Cronkite might say, this meant that we were behind in the race for space. A lot of Americans went into a grim panic. In those days, you may remember, whenever things went badly for us, the custom was to assume that one of our own had sold us out. On this occasion, Dewey was fingered. The indictment went something like this. John Dewey was the father and maybe the mother of the progressive education movement. Progressive education was a kind of gooey, precious, romantic philosophy which stressed permissiveness and life adjustment. There was no place in it for rigorous thinking, discipline, or social responsibility. Moreover, progressive education was championed by know-nothing education professors and had taken over as the dominant philosophy of American schools. As a result, our country had been burdened with at least two generations of self-indulgent ignoramuses, specifically kids who had no stomach or preparation for building rockets and other important things. And that's why we were losing to the Russians. Life magazine and the New York Times stressed these points pretty hard, but they were moderate in comparison with Admiral Hyman Rickover, who for a time devoted most of his energies to attacking the schools and their Deweyistic leanings. Rickover, the father and maybe the mother of the atomic submarine, was among other things under the impression that a child's school day was mostly absorbed by frill subjects such as basket weaving and free-form dancing. He ferociously denounced the waste of it all, urging that we return to what he called the basics. He was joined by many others who accused the schools of quackery and of not understanding the perilous position we occupied as leader of the free world. Yeah. Well, that's Neil Postman, a very beautiful opening that he's reading to the book that he collaborated with, with Charles Weingartner, and it's called The School Book. Subtap, people want to know what all the hollering is about, and Delacorte, the publishers, and, and Neil Postman is one of my favorite educators, and uh, he is a favorite, too, of Jonathan Kozal, Matt Hentoff, and John Holton. Uh, he and Weingartner before had written Teaching as Subversive Activity and the Soft Revolution. Now we start with this moment, don't we? Mm -hmm. And the hollerers were the hollerers of the military, and then the hollerers switched and became hollerers of the other side. And so right. that's how it began, this whole re-evaluation or whatever it is of, of our, not educational, these school systems. Right. What's the difference? Well, <laughs> uh, it's an important difference because I think educating oneself is a, is a personal, uh, natural, lifelong quest. Schools are simply a complex social institution. I like to think, Studs, that um, uh, education is to schooling what loving is to marriage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And while it's certainly true that uh, occasionally, or at least I've heard of it, someone could have a loving relationship within a marriage. You heard of it. <laughs> uh, it's very important not to confuse yeah. the two. The institution as against the feeling. That's right. And that's basically what's, what we're talking about now. We're talking about schools against education. And the subtitle is The Hollerers. And so it began in 57, that is the new kind of hollering, right. uh, from the military, from the technicians to we got to develop technicians to outstrip them. Right. But then a switch occurred, didn't it, right. as far as the hollering? I think what happened was that um, uh, after the, the military man and the uh, technocrats had their uh, grievances uh, aired, uh, there came along a group of, um, well, all kinds of people. I was going to say uh, educators, but, by, but that's not true. In fact, many of them were... Um, uh, people from outside the field of education altogether. And basically what they were asking uh, is, what's a school for? Is it really to be an instrument in the Cold War? Uh, 
Is that is that what it's all about, or um, can we shoot for something grander? And um, that's that would be in the uh, early '60s, and that's mm. when the hollering um, really began. And the people that you mentioned before, like Kozel and Nat Hentoff and John Holt and George Dennison and George Leonard and people like this, um, and Jimmy Herndon. That's right. Mm. Uh, began to flood our consciousness mm -hmm. with observations about how the schools were operating in a way that militated against intelligence and the growth of intelligence. And with this began, I suppose, what they call the alternative school That's right. movement. Because people then said, uh, that some people said, well, if the public schools are intractable, and uh, impervious to change, yeah. well, then what we've got to do is develop a parallel system, yeah. which has become known as the alternative yeah. school movement. I suppose, too, at that time, when the hollering switched, also Paul Goodman's growing up absurd, Nick mm -hmm. Friedenberg's book, the question that our schools to teach obedience and passivity as, as, as against uh, imagination and free thinking. Well, I'm glad you mentioned Goodman. Be uh, I missed him before, yeah. and of course, he's the... Uh, the grandfather of us all here, because he he really raised um, I, I, the exact title of the book escapes me for the moment. Growing I'm, up absurd. No, I'm not thinking no. of that. I think no. it's called personnel, personnel mm. or people, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that. And and Goodman raised that issue. He said, "What do what do we want to produce? Mm. Personnel that yeah. is processed people. Yeah. You know, processed." Uh, adjuncts of the economy or do we want real human beings mm. and so he really posed the the fundamental question that all the hollerists uh, yeah. got interested yeah. in so we'll come to your approach in a moment before we just keep going as far as the hollering the 15 years then came uh, we'll talk about the free school movement and the conflicts within that and then came uh, an Illich who believes in de-schooling yeah. now we come to another aspect don't we? yeah well on on uh, Illich this is uh, Ivan Illich, for, for those who aren't familiar with, uh, with this business. Um, really, in a way, so now this, I'm speaking now only for myself and not as a representative of any point of view. Um, f from my point of view, Illich puts an end to school criticism. Uh, what he says, in effect, is that the modern school is something like the medieval church. It's, it's essentially a political and economic institution through which all must pass who want to achieve any kind of status in the society. So he says, well, Europe eventually de-churched itself and became secular and opened up avenues of opportunity for people who didn't want to go the church route. And he says, well, why don't we do this here? Why don't we de-school ourselves? get rid of that whole level of uh, bureau bureaucratic paperwork um, and uh, try to invent some new networks through which we can educate people. Now, I'm not an Illichian because I, I simply don't see any possibility of the American school system going away. There are 48 million kids going to our schools. Um, they're, they're not going to disappear, no matter what uh, uh, Illich thinks. And so people like me are um, uh, uh, unreconstructed reformers. Uh, we, our imaginations are not quite as uh, grand Rather than revolutionary that's in right. the Illich sense. And so I'm content to say, all right, the reality is that the schools are here. Uh, we're not going to become de-schooled. So what can we do with this monstrous institution to make it better for kids, yeah. you see? Now, there, there are people in the movement who think that guys like me are the enemy mm. because I, I'm sure you've heard that point of view They before. think you're a sellout artist. That's right. They, their because view, you, don't want, you don't want to de-school. Right. right. Their view is that if you make school, if you improve schools, yeah. all you do is prolong yeah. the agony. Yeah. Whereas for them, the, the real clean yeah. solution is just yeah. to eliminate. Of course, this is the, uh, how can I describe these guys and these women? These are the, are not really revolutionaries. They are what I call the ersatz revolutionaries. 
they're the ones who really don't give a damn about human life. You know, in a way, that you're talking now about young people right now in our society. What can be done to salvage lives? What can be done to open windows? Right. And you know. um, on this point you just made, uh, uh, I don't want to sound uh, patronizing to, to uh, some of these uh, revolutionaries. But I think to some extent, Studs, the, you have a case here of people who have got um, captivated by their own rhetoric. Mm -hmm. I mean, this has happened yeah, before I to know. others, mm -hmm. that uh, they've ma they, they started out by making a very passionate and uh, deeply felt uh, a point about what mm -hmm. was happening, but uh, didn't confront the reality yeah. principle yeah. along the way and, and have painted themselves into a yeah. kind of box. Yeah. So your, your book, yours and Weingartner's book, then, is divided into two parts. The first part is the history of the hollering, mm -hmm. the dissenters, both sides, beginning with the military, the right, and the dissenting from the other point of view. Right. And the second is what's to be done. What's to be basically. done. So let's still continue with the matter of the, of the first part for you, the what's to be done. What we see now, you also point out the commercials that we see on TV. And there's horrendous ones that say about uh, you stay in school because you can make out better economically if you do. That thing, of course, is pretty rotten for a couple of reasons, isn't it? Yeah, well, I think so. It, w one of them is that apparently it's not quite true. Mm. That is not for most kids. Of course, it would be true for kids who hang on and then go on to prestigious professional schools and become physicians and um, lawyers and so on. But for most kids, uh, all the evidence we have indicates that you don't really make much more money over a lifetime by hanging in uh, in school than leaving it. But of course another reason is that uh, uh, that's a hell of a comment yeah. Yeah. on what we're doing in our yeah. schools. If all, if our most compelling argument yeah. is, listen, just behave yourself, mm. hang tough, and you'll make a few dollars more than if, if you go, if you, if you leave. And the other, is that what education, is, is that what knowledge is about too, you see? Yeah. To make it, or is there something else? And this is what you talk about education as against school. Now, on, on the subject of, of education, and I'm, I'm sure I'll get a, a good reception from you on this, uh, one of the most appalling deficiencies in our schools uh, so far as uh, not educating children is concerned, is that there is almost no attention paid in helping kids to learn how to ask questions. And this, I've always found this mind-boggling because it seems to me that if a person learns how to ask a question, he or she has learned almost all you really need to learn. Yeah. At no one, I think, would deny that question asking is the most important yeah. intellectual tool we have. Yeah. Yet, reflect for the moment on the fact that this tool is not dealt with in the schools in any systematic way. Yeah, yeah. I remember uh, John Holt and how children fail mm -hmm. raises this in such you know graphic, vivid, and horrible ways too. The kids are afraid to ask questions, so they ask questions that will win the affection, will please the teacher. You know, That's right. D uh, John Dewey himself uh, commented on this very thing oh. in a nice little phrase. Oh. He said that the tragedy of the schools is that kids learned how to satisfy the teacher, not the problem. Yeah. yeah. So that uh, going to s uh, being effective in school for the most part means uh, being uh, ingratiating, mm -hmm. uh, being um, able to satisfy the conditions set down by your teacher, but not really engaging in any mm -hmm. serious intellectual yeah. work. It raises the question, what is good behavior? Okay. Who, what is a well-behaved student? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah. And the schools in general define a well-behaved uh, student as someone who sits up straight in, in his seat and does his assignments and uh, uh, doesn't make a whole lot of trouble and uh, of certainly doesn't ask embarrassing questions. Yeah. For instance, uh, I did a study some years ago of the questions that kids asked in class, and I found that I think it was something like 93% of them, I can't remember now, were what I called what-am-I-thinking type questions. Mm -hmm. 
Th that is, those are the questions asked by the teachers. Mm -hmm. What am I thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. basically. Mm -hmm. Can you guess what I have in my head? Now, the questions asked by the students were almost all of an administrative type. For mm -hmm. instance, um, does spelling count? A student can always ask that. Yeah. Um, can, I, uh, can I use a pencil to yeah. do this test? But if a student asks a question like, why are we doing this? Uh. Or what am I expected to get out of this experience? This is always considered to be an impudent question. You don't find many teachers who would welcome that sort of question. You know, uh, a wild thought occurs to me before we come to the second half of the book, the what to do about it. Within the school system, within the conventions that we have, this is Neil Postman's guest, the questions being asked by the students, the, 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 the technical question, or the question that has nothing to do with feeling, right. nothing to do with why, but how do I do this, or what, nothing with why. Uh, I see now the students growing up. There was a film festival recently. Think of this for a moment, the connection. Satyajit Rai, the great film director, was here. It was a very beautiful film called The Music Room. It was an old early film of his that dealt with the end of aristocratic society, the merchants taking over. And all the questions were, now, how much money did it take you to make the film? That was one. How much, where'd you raise mm -hmm. the money? Two, is that long shot you had? Tell us how you did that long shot. Now, how'd you get that mm -hmm. close up? But not a word about what the theme was. Why did you choose the theme of this end of the caste system, or whatever it was? This is directly yeah. related to what you're talking about. Well, I don't know how you know wide ranging we want to get here. Yeah, but I was just wide <laughs> as you want to get. Uh, uh, this, I suppose, is a little bit out of my, uh, uh, as they say, area of expertise. That's what they yeah, say so down we'll in Washington. Let's we'll talk about that <laughs> yeah. phrase to expertise okay. in a moment. But uh, it occurs to me that many of the uh, contemporary filmmakers in America are. Um, young men who are just dazzling, dazzlingly brilliant in their use of technique, but, um, uh, but they are not very much concerned with what most people would call values. I think you have to be very specific. It's yeah. obvious. A kid from Chicago, Billy Friedkin, is a classic case in part. Yeah, right. Billy, I know him. Marvelous technician, fantastic technician, and any technique, and yet you have Exorcist and you have French Connection. What are these films? What do they yeah. tell us? Well, I think what they are, Studs, mm -hmm. is their celebrations of, of new techniques with the camera. And, the, and um, uh, I think part of their, a very substantial part of their popularity mm -hmm. is that audiences are enthralled by the technique. And there's no doubt that Friedkin um, uh, is uh, very, uh, to say the least, precocious in his command of these new techniques, of new shots, of new uh, cutting uh, methods know, and so forth. I know, I knew guys are great in techniques in the 30s, too, politically, you know, in Middle Europe, you know? That was all technique, yeah. too, wasn't it? You see, what does it lead to? That's, the very fa that's what your book is all about, it seems. That's, this is by way of coming back. It's not unrelated to the questions that are asked, the questions the students, teachers like students to ask and don't, and the questions about feeling. Yeah, about well, I think your, your point is, of course, that what we do in school has consequences Absolutely. Uh, 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 on the culture at large, and, and it'll show up in, uh, in all sorts of strange places. I think it shows up, uh, um, for example, let's take Sesame Street. Um, uh, m apparently, most uh, kids, I'm not, I'm not really sure of this, but I, I, uh, I have the impression most kids prefer something like Sesame Street to uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. Do, do you know that show? No, you, why, why, don't you, why don't you speak of it? Well, this is a show that's done by a guy named Fred Rogers, who, uh, also appealing to preschoolers and uh, first and second graders and so forth. But Rogers is almost wholly concerned with the feeling life of children, how, how they feel about themselves and their situation and their families, their relationships to others and so on. He's not overly concerned with what the educators call cognitive development. What is cognitive development? Well, the, what, what most people would call uh, intellectual skills, learning how to read, learning uh, arithmetic and so forth. He feels that, that those things will come uh, and that in any case, as he said in a, an article he wrote in a journal called Psychiatric Opinion, that uh, the real question is whether or not a kid will use his alphabet to um, uh, uh, describe a sunrise or um, 
Oh, no, I guess he says, will use his numbers, his knowledge of numbers, to build a bridge or to do the final count at Buchenwald. Yeah. See? Now, Sesame Street, I don't want to land too hard on that because I think in, in lots of ways it's, it's a serious attempt to do something important. But generally, it's a kind of, it's a frantic show to begin with. And it's almost wholly concerned with getting kids to learn some technique. And this is, uh, Americans at the present time, I think, are very much in, enthralled by technique. For many years, we felt we can solve our problems if only we can get a better technique. And we forestalled asking the why questions. Yeah. You know, why are we doing... Even with the, the, the uh, oil crisis now, that's kind of interesting. I mean, it, uh, people never really ask themselves, I think, why, do, why should we organize our cities around automobiles? Mm -hmm. Why should we organize our social lives around automobiles? It was just assumed that since the automobile was here, uh, the only problem was to get a better automobile. Now, of course, with the gas shortage, maybe some of these questions will come up, you know, for the first time. Sometimes that happens. Yeah. People are forced, when there's a failure of yeah. technique, yes. then people yeah. seem to go to That's the value question. There's a failure of technique, maybe people might start asking, how come? Not yeah. how come we fail, but why in the first yeah. place? Incidentally, this yeah. uh, has ramifications all over the place. Uh, the, um, I heard someone comment the other day about all these sex books, people who are... Uh, uh, dissatisfied with their sexual lives and most of the sex books have to do with technique, technique. and people yeah. buy the books because they've been convinced they've been made to believe that the reason they're they're unhappy is that they they their um, their technique isn't good but of course anyone who's lived uh, any sort of life at all ought to know that that is not the problem in lovemaking. Every aspect of life really deals with technique in our society at this moment. The emphasis, in fact, your book throughout touches on this. In fact, your epilogue says this book is anti-technique, or rather it's challenging. Yes. Technique, Iber Alice. Basically that, what it is. Exactly, yeah. Iber Alice, because yeah. it's, it's, I, I don't think we're making here a, a kind of mindless uh, cri you know, no. criticism of no. technique because obviously a technique has to play a role yeah. in, in human affairs. Yeah. But I do think we've rather uh, uh, pushed ourselves and yeah. and, and technique yeah. beyond natural yeah. limits. And that's why, by the way, this is a good spot also to vindicate John Dewey, isn't it? The misinterpretation of Dewey through the years, too, has gone so often unchallenged. Yes. Well, one of the things that's always amused me about that one, Studs, is that uh, First of all, people who uh, lambaste uh, Dewey the hardest very often are people who haven't read him. Or as one guy said to me once when I challenged him on this, he said, well, I haven't read him personally. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what that means. No, but. a man with technique <laughs> read him. Yeah. A man with technique told him that Dewey right. doesn't have technique. Uh, as so far as I'm aware, uh, Dewey wrote, um, uh, I think, 42 books in his lifetime, uh, many of them, of course, about education. Anyone who's read Dewey on education knows that what he stood for, first and foremost, was rigor and self-discipline. But somewhere in the public mind, I think Dewey got mixed up with Freud. Mm -hmm. That is, they, they, their ideas were being disseminated mm -hmm. in America at roughly the same time, and people associated Dewey with um, permissiveness and a kind of... Um, um, a willingness simply to allow people to express themselves mm -hmm. regardless of the consequences mm -hmm. to other people. Of course, Dewey, uh, the, the, this isn't Dewey at all. See, we're also talking here about several things, the misinterpretation of Dewey, uh, and year after year until finally the myth is believed rather than the truth. And only every aspect of our life this is so. By whom? And now we come, before we take a break and talk about the second part of your book, the experts, expertise. Now. In the early part of your book, you're talking about the interest now of quote-unquote ordinary people in the school system who are challenging not the knowledge of expert experts, but the fact that the dictatorial air of experts. And also, I think um, uh, what they're challenging is the very good possibility that the experts, have, have uh, as they very often do, have simply asked the wrong question. For example... 
Skinner, uh, who's much in the public mind these days, he is fundamentally, as I see it, a technician. What he is offering is a way to get to, to control the behavior of students. But um, uh, he doesn't really f um, confront the question, what sort of behavior do we want? He, he, in effect, he says, well, that, uh, um, um, others should decide that. You know, he doesn't want to really address value, himself. The phrase we that. love these days is value-free. Right. Value free. Value free. Yeah. And of course, there's no such thing as value yeah. free. And, and uh, the experts, perhaps, uh, I don't want to sound paranoid or necessarily imply a conspiratorial yeah. uh, operation here, but I think experts uh, uh, have a vested interest in promoting that idea. Don't they so often together? Often you find we had an incredible school superintendent here. Incredibly bad, but the defense of all the PhDs toward doctor so and so. I love those doctors so and so, mm. and that technicians and the, and the PhDs are flaunted all over the place, you know. And there's, there's banding together in defense of an interest, indeed, isn't it? Yeah, and I think that the, the, the ordinary people you refer to, yeah. uh, although the ordinary people differ, yeah, differ with other ordinary yeah. people uh, quite a bit in in, in their values. Uh, all over the place, at least as I see it, are beginning to ask uh, some why questions, yeah. some feeling questions. And I think this is where we'll take a slight pause. And God also, in the second part of the book, it's a marvelous and powerful, very terribly important one, I think. It's also practical. The school book, the subtitle for people who want to know what all the hollering is about. My guest is one of the co-authors, and marvelous observer of the school system, Neil Postman, together with Charles Weingartner, wrote this in Delacorte Press. And one of the questions, obviously, is going to be, the whole matter of IQ tests and Shockley and Jensen and Hernstein and this matter of genes. We'll return to that in a moment after we hear from this message. Resuming the conversation with Neil Postman, now the second half of the book. Now we have the hollering, uh, the challenges, what's to be done. And here you come specific now. You speak of a school system as it is, and not a question of de-schooling or overthrowing mm -hmm. the schools. And you speak of directions in which they may be going, in some cases are going. You name about 35 ways. Where do we begin uh, with uh, what, where you see direction going which should be encouraged? You start with structure, something structured. All schools are structured. Right. No matter how free a school is, it's structured. It's structured. And uh, that's a takeoff. Uh, um, on this, uh, sometimes you hear people talk about uh, uh, should we have a non-structured or a structured school? Well, because I think that's a yeah. phony yeah. Uh, a question. That all human uh, communication situations are structured. When two people meet and one says hello, that's the beginning of a of yeah, a structure. Of uh, so the question is, what kind of structure do we want? Uh, I start with the assumption that uh, schools will structure the activities and the time of children. What we now have to decide is what kind of procedures or conventions will we invent to make this the most sensible structuring. And that depends on what the kinds of kids you want to produce. For instance, if you want to develop uh, in children the capacity to ask good questions, you have to structure the situation so that they're asking questions all the time. If uh, they're discouraged from asking questions or if the teacher's doing all the asking, yeah. then you're not going to produce kids who, who know how to do this. Yeah. Is a tendency, do you sense more of a trend to this? That is the questioning of children now of why? Well, there are two trends. That, that the one that I find uh, personally very gratifying, which is that uh, uh, this movement toward um, the open classroom, this movement toward uh, the inductive mm -hmm. method, the movement toward uh, offering um, alternative structures mm -hmm. that the parents and kids can choose from. But on the other hand, there's another trend toward uh, uh, behavior, behaviorism and accountability and so forth, which is moving in, in the opposite direction. There's a real clash going on right moving now. Moving up, you mean in the, in the Skinner way, you mean? Yes, mm -hmm. moving toward more rig rigidity, mm -hmm. more specific control over yeah. the movements and behavior uh, of children. So you see you see it going two ways, two extremes in a mm -hmm. sense, don't you? It's interesting, yeah. And there's... Uh, there's a polarization then in education. That's right, that's right. Part of it, uh, it grows out, part of this uh, struggle grows out of this whole thing that's called accountability. 
and accountability has two sides. Oh, yeah. I mean, people say, uh, well, for crying out loud, I'm accountable in, in my work. Um, uh, why shouldn't teachers be accountable? And I think that's a, it's a legitimate mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. But the form that this has yeah. taken for some people yeah. is to say something like this. I want the teacher to be able to specify precisely what the children will be able to do in June yeah. that they couldn't do in September. And, I, and yeah. now, in places like California, where they actually have uh, the legislatures passed a, a nefarious act called the Stull Bill, they've, they've, they now require teachers to specify. So in other words, they have to account specifically what that kid will be like. In other words, it's not a, it's not a human being they're accounting with. It's a product. It's, a, it's an object. An object. Right. Yeah. And, and so what the teachers are doing in, in, in self-defense mm-hmm. is that they're specifying the most trivial possible behaviors uh, uh, because those things are, are the uh, most observable. Yeah. For instance, they'll say, okay, uh, I promise that these kids will be able to spell uh, correctly yeah. 85 out of 100 words on a hard yeah. word list, say. Yeah. Well, now that's something that's yeah. testable, it's measurable, yeah. Yeah. and the teacher could say, well, there, see, yeah. I'm, I'm accountable. By I the way, we, we can be freewheeling, and as you talk later on, we'll come back to uh, the other aspect of accountability in a moment, the affirmative aspect, as mm-hmm. you and I would see it, accountability to community, a part of it. Before that, uh, how spell... Now you, sp- you speak to literacy and literacy. Yes. Well, that's a, that's a big thing with me because I, uh, on two counts, one is that I, uh, while I, I think uh, what I, uh, that literacy and the ability to read well is terribly important, I don't think that it's exclusively important, and I really think it's necessary for the schools to um, enlarge their definition of literacy to include the new uh, media of communication, how to listen, how, how to, to see a film, how to look at television. I think somewhere in there I uh, uh, say that um, there is a common argument uh, that goes, we need a nation of good readers in order to get humane statesmen and politicians. And I counter that by saying, and I think this is probably a conservative way of putting it, that probably not one American out of 100,000 has ever read anything Richard Nixon ever wrote. So that if, if there's any one communication skill on which our hopes for political humanity depend, I, I, I suppose it would be listening or televiewing or something yeah, like this. Yeah. But, but that's not the point because I really don't mean to put down reading. I'm simply talking yeah. about the idea of enlarging our... What has happened? Uh, what has happened as far as the means by which a person knows or learns, you know, whatever it is. We know there is a certain kind of music, as you say. We know there is television. We know there is radio. We know there is film. And we know some uh, really mind-boggling statistics, uh, which just might be worth mentioning, which is that when the average Chicago kid, and it's New York kid and L.A. Mm -hmm. kid too, gets to kindergarten, he's clocked about 5,000 hours in front of a television set. Now that's more time, as Margaret Mead pointed out, than he or she has spent with their father. So this tells us something yeah. about the role of the new media. So, but I want to make the yeah. other point, two studs, about the literacy, literacy yeah. thing, that even if the school said, okay, all we're going to do is teach reading, they don't even do that well because actually they're, they're uh, mostly concerned with the cracking, with what the linguists call cracking the code level. They simply shoot for maybe roughly fifth grade levels of, of competence. They don't really teach what I think both of us would call real literacy. Yeah. That is how to, um, how to make meaning from, from yeah. the, the printed page yeah. and, and, and how to cope with it in, yeah. in a critical and discerning way. Yeah. And by the way, the other aspect of accountability, and that's the school. Also, you think of the school as a resource in the, co- in the community itself, not as a building. Uh, the Southern, you hear the Southern School here in Chicago, the Southern School? Jonathan Kozel. Yes, a, yes. Zimmerman. And he thinks of this, his school, not just the building, but the way it is in the community, knows the parents, the people. That aspect is also yeah. 
the other part of accountability. Right, right? and of course I think that is, in, in my judgment, the, the healthiest and the richest uh, kind of definition of accountability. Uh, to, to make the whole school situation such an integral part of, of the community that there's constant yeah. feedback and, and yeah. interaction yeah. between parents and, yeah. and teachers and kids. You see and this so happening in some schools. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, but then whenever I say that, I immediately yeah. comes to mind the, the opposite yeah. views, which, which um, uh, and this is where that IQ uh, stuff I comes in. I hit that now. Uh, we don't want to lo lose that. Yeah. The whole matter, more and more we read of, and of course, I, I know you and I disagree with the people who would stop Shockley from making yes. an ass of himself uh, speaking. Uh, you know, there are those who, who say we've got to stop this, and it's quite horrible, I think, the stopping of a guy. But both we discussed these. Some of these guys won Nobel Prizes. Or physics, or whatever. So the Shockley, Jensen, Hernstein, and mm -hmm. oh, you take yeah. over. Well, l let's just uh, so we get it straight. Uh, Shockley's uh, Nobel Prize uh, he shared with some others for the invention of the transistor, um, and he's now entered into the field of human genetics. And of course, I'm sure most of your listeners know his uh, view is that um, there is. Um, a qualitative difference uh, in intelligence between blacks and whites, and that that uh, difference grows out of genetic factors. The implication being that there's not a hell of a lot you can do environmentally to overcome this. And of course, there are certain frightening uh, conclusions that flow from this, which is, uh, for example, um, what is it called, eugenics. That is simply say, well, if uh, if we've got uh, a dumb group of people genetically in the culture, let's uh, discourage them from mating so that they won't produce more dumb people. This is one of the directions that sort of thinking can go. Um, and I also just want to say, as by way of footnote, that I agree with you 100% that the attempts to stop Shockley from presenting this point of view are... Help uh, Shockley. Uh, yes, and are horrifying. And... Right. and uh, uh, people should, uh, who should know better yeah. very often are involved in that. But my own view of it is this, that it, it is, uh, when you come right down to it, um, a racist position. I, I don't you know, just want to use labels, but I if you study uh, the history of American education, w um, at certain points in time, this issue surfaces. Uh, it was used against other people. I remember uh, a clown years ago, I was a kid, his name was Lathrop Stoddard, way, way back in the 20s. And I think Franz Boas clobbered him, others did, you know, you know yes. clobbered him. Here it goes again, why does it come back all the time? It, it, it I think it's in part, uh, believe it or not, uh, uh, related to economic issues. When, when, when you get an economic pinch, um, people begin to look around for ways to separate out who should get, who should get and who shouldn't. And this is a very convenient way to say, well, it's natural for a certain class of people to get to get because genetically they're simply superior, mm -hmm. and the, and and ah. and there's like a natural law, a natural reason why these people yeah. don't get. I think you want to put on ice right now the the sources, uh, the base of Shockley, Hernstein, Jensen. That's the IQ test. Yeah. No, well, they use, uh, certainly Jensen, oh, there's one thing I do want to say, because I used the word racist before, which I almost never use, and I, um, that I don't mean to imply by any means that Hernstein and Jensen are themselves uh, racists. Uh, I think they're doing what they, what they think ought to be done. I meant to say that the implications of their work turn out to be racist. Now, they use the IQ test for the most part, uh, uh, to, to come to this conclusion. And, and uh, uh, most people don't even know what, what an IQ test is. And of course, what it is really is, uh, is a set of questions <laughs> which people are asked to answer. And, the, uh, and then on, on some statistical basis, a correlation is made between scores on such a test and let's say performance in school. Mm. And um, uh, it is inferred from this correlation that what in fact you are testing is something called intelligence. 
and this ought to be laid to rest here. Why don't you go ahead? No self-respecting psychologist would, in fact, make that statement. They, an intelligent, in fact, I would say they're not even sure, most of them, what it is that they're testing. Uh, the best that they could say is that there is, in fact, a correlation on a statistical basis between certain scores on these tests and certain um, achievements in schools or achievement in, in industry or the military. Um, but um, uh, no one listening, I think, should believe that you're directly intelli uh, uh, measuring inte intelligence is something that cannot, in fact, be measured yeah. directly, and no one has even defined it. You also point something else out, that the questions that are offered are offered for certain. There is no culture-free IQ yes, test. Yes, that's true. And uh, there have been many efforts to uh, develop culture-free IQ tests, but of course, uh, uh, by definition, it wouldn't be possible to develop such tests. The very tests. nature of it, I, the question, I mean, I, that's why my mind is bogged about people taking these guys seriously. The very question themselves are more or less oriented mm. toward middle class mm. white society. Right. The very nature of the questions. Right. And of course, you know, this comes back to what we were saying before about technique. Mm -hmm. Because uh, an IQ test, in fact, is a technique for discriminating among people. Yeah. And when it's taken so seriously as some people take it, yeah. uh, it gets to be a situation of the uh, tail wagging the dog. Yeah. Because you have a, see, see I would say if a teacher, they have this, these terms that they use in education, um, an overachiever. Yeah. Have you ever heard that term? Overachiever. And, 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 uh, I, like under, I like under, <laughs> I lean toward underachievers. Okay, well let's talk about overachiever just for a minute. Yeah. What that means is that someone is acting smarter than someone else yeah. thinks he ought to act. Uh, why do they think he's acting more smart than he should act? Well, because he took a test someplace, yeah. and they believe the test, and they said, well, he can't be this smart, so they call him an overachiever. Yeah, I'll never because. forget, this is connected. <laughs> Norman Podoretz mm -hmm. called my Negro problem, way back mm -hmm. when Negro, and he explained the difficulty he had with a black kid when he, when he was this little Jewish white kid in school. He was always raising his hand, jumping up from, he was bright in school, he always got socked. Well, if I were there, I'd have socked him too. <laughs> I'd have clobbered him. You're just raising, I know, teacher. Yeah. Well, of course, that's very abrasive to someone who doesn't have quite that mm. same sure. setup. Sure, and, and then know? part of the, the, this I whole issue uh, is, uh, uh, after all, um, language. The, the language of tests and the language of schools tends to be, of course, the language of what we would call the middle class yeah. white. You put a kid in, uh, in that environment, um, who is, doesn't really have a, a full command of that language, and he is going to appear mm. more confused or more disoriented than others. But suppose that kid tells a story his grandmother, with whom he lives, told him that night. Suppose he tells uh, a song she sang to him, or whatever it was, recount something that his aunt, whom he lives with, say, in a project, told him. Yes. I say, now, well, wouldn't that be part of... Yes, if, mm -hmm. that would be a, a, a manifestation of his intelligence. Mm -hmm. But what would happen to that kid is that his English teacher would correct his grammar yeah. and ruin the whole damn yeah. thing, yeah. you see. And, and say, well, he just can't learn. Yeah. He, you know, yeah. he can't learn, you see. Yeah. And, and the, all the poetry. And the poetry be gone. be gone. And the feeling would all be gone. So, this is what it's about. But isn't see, it? this kind of stuff does come up when, um, when you have uh, uh, economic problems um, and when you have other kinds of crises in a society. Uh, the schools tend to uh, serve as a kind of sensor or veto system. To, oh. to weed people out. Yeah. Now, I mean, you, you could just as well say, well, let's, uh, let's uh, uh, put I uh, all people under 5'8". You know, we'll put them in vocational schools. All, all fellas over 5'8", we'll, we'll let them go yeah. on to Northwestern yeah. or something like that. I mean, that, from my point of view, that would yeah. almost make as much sense as the uh, present methods of discrimination. Because using the school as the, as the metaphor for almost everything, as the, as the roundup place, what better example than the phony busing issue, of course, isn't it? Yeah. That's the classic right. case, isn't it? Yeah. Now, see, now that's a real complicated yeah, issue. Be yeah. To begin with, Americans, so far as I could tell, are not against busing. Because uh, even before the present uh, brouhaha, um, uh, more American kids, I believe this is a fact, were being bused to school than not. 
The problem is where the bus is going and who's on it. Okay, so that's, that's the problem. Now here's where it gets complicated. What's happening, Studs, and I think this is uh, historically true as well as in the present, is the schools are being used, as they always have been used, to try to solve some intractable social and economic problems. Um, uh, if um, the, if uh, kids are cracking up <clears throat> cars on the road, what do we say? Well, let's give driver education in schools. If uh, young girls are becoming pregnant, let's give sex education. If there's too much bigotry, let's have teach tolerance in the schools. In other words, people throw onto their schools all the social problems that they can't solve in the society. So this is what's happening with the busing. They're saying, well, well, in America, black and white people simply don't live together. And there's a dramatic economic difference between them. So let's see if we can use the schools to solve the problem. So this is this is where it's at. It's insoluble now, since there's segregation right. by neighborhood and since there is job uh, uh, different. And That's and right, and of course it the, you get some sort yeah. of really yeah. peculiar turns yeah. to this, like in New York, when the black people in uh, what was called Ocean Hill Brownsville were hollering that they wanted community control, and um, then all the the white liberals say were were for them, right? Now, then was some white, some white working class people also in Canarsie in Brooklyn recently said the same thing. They wanted community control. Yeah. The, the white liberals weren't <laughs> for them. They said, well, they're racist, yeah, yeah, you see. Yeah. But these There's white people yeah, the white were really saying, well, yeah. if the blacks can uh, have this sort of control yeah. over who will teach in their yeah. schools and who can come in, we should have the same Which, thing. Which, of course, shows how the <laughs> issue is, is a ridiculous <laughs> yes. issue of busing because uh, in many cases, and be quite frank, some of these white liberals had kids in other schools, you know. In yeah, private school. I hate to overwork that issue yeah. too. But right, uh, it, it it. However, it does yeah. surface from time yeah. to time that that uh, a lot of people who have uh, who have been very quick to call yeah. whites racist on this issue yeah. are people who themselves yeah. uh, have protected yeah. their children in yeah. quotes from any yeah. of this trouble by putting yeah. them in private schools. The big schools. thing is uh, the white liberals double standard here came from a false issue to begin with, since right. if, if the neighborhood matter is not handled and the job matter is not handled, how right. can the school do it? Right. Yeah. And because I really think on the, uh, uh, I'm not qualified to say anything about the situation in Chicago, but in New York I have the strongest impression that that issue is not a racial issue at all, but an economic issue. People are running, I don't think from blacks, but are running from poor people mm. and the culture of poverty. Yeah which of course is quite understandable. Yeah. The crime rate in Harlem, for example, is eight times the crime rate in Forest Hills, which is a middle-class yeah. white section in, and in New York. And the victims of those crimes are 80%, 90% black. That's right. Yeah. So I think we do have some you know, yeah, critical course, and fundamental economic issues here. And um, I think some of our politicians have uh, uh, just acted horrendously on this by not uh, trying to uh, make clear yeah. what the fundamental you know, all, issues are. All we're doing are. As, an, as an hour almost runs so quickly with Neil Postman, who must return as a guest, is touching on this very beautiful book. And we haven't, we've hardly touched the second part of your book. Uh, the book is called The School Book by Neil Postman, my guest, and, and his colleague, Charles Weingartner, at Delacorte Press. We still have time, I think, and, uh, the school you say is a mirror, basically, of our society's values. This is what it basically is, the school is. That's right. But it's a special kind of mirror in that it's a little bit like the mirror in, um, that the, uh, the wicked queen in Snow White had. It was the most beautiful of all. Yes. We like to look at it and uh, get back a reflection mm -hmm. um, that indicates that we're somewhat better than mm -hmm. we are. And that's all right, too. I think that's a, mm -hmm. that's a good thing, that we look to our schools to give us an image yeah. of what we ought to be. Yeah. And um, uh, of course, we never can be that, and mm -hmm. so uh, we're always disappointed in our schools. But, but we can, I think, uh, use our schools as an instrument yeah. for social change to some extent yeah. because because right. of this fact. You have this marvelous fable, a fable of plan or reality. I think you could time mm. for the fable. Because yeah. the fable really is a reality. <laughs> well, what the, reality. the basis of the fable is simply this, that as everyone listening knows, uh, Americans' towns and cities are in a lot of trouble. 
and uh, uh, we need to create more livable communities. I figure we simply cannot afford to keep hundreds of thousands of energetic, idealistic, intelligent young people locked up in schools um, for seven hours a day. So the basis of the fable is that we should try to reconstruct their education in a way which would permit them to participate in rebuilding our communities. Get them out, let them uh, direct traffic, let them deliver mail, let them beautify the city, let them clean up the neighborhoods, let them run festivals and science fairs and newspapers. This and would be part of education in yes, school, school. That's right. This would, we, in that instance, we'd make schooling and educating come one. closer together, mm -hmm. one, you see. And uh, by the way, things like this are being done. In, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, for instance, their um, uh, junior high school students are given credit for teaching elementary school That's children. Right. And didn't you point in Colorado, uh, a Fruta Monument High School in Colorado, a couple of students came up with plans that's right, for teaching. For teaching. And in, in the state of Vermont, the, the uh, Department of Education gives full academic credit to seniors in high school for uh, participation in their senior year in political, ecological, mm. and social uh, institutions. And, in, and there's a metro school here in Chicago, metro, the kids go out to certain places, you know, yeah. that's part of school. Now, I think that's a very promising idea, and, and the... Uh, uh, the more we work toward it, I think uh, the more we'll be right on target. Do you see this? You see this happening. You call it accountability, by the way, to the future, too. You speak of that, too. You see this. Well, you see a polarity, don't you? You, you see the two extremes at work, don't you, at this moment? Yes, that on the one hand, the, those who, who uh, um, want um, really more paper and pencil tests, more rigidity, more specific control of the behavior of children in classroom, and on, on, on the other, people who want real community involvement. Yeah. And you, you, this also involves, of course, parents, PTA, you speak of questions that, that indeed could be asked, could come up, community, the nature of community control, the problems involved there too, phonies at work on both sides, right. all is there. Yeah. And how do we end it? Just this is, it's, it's, of course, it's a non-ending matter. And that was something I was gonna ask you about. There's so much, we let it go for now, I think. You said that Neil Postman is my guest, and it's a challenging book, but strangely enough, a hopeful, I feel it's a hopeful book. Well, I, yeah, I've, I'm a kind of optimistic about the situation. Um, if you get some other school critics here, you may get a different point of view on that. Some of them um, uh, have left the game because uh, they found that uh, there's a lot of hard work and compromise and... <clears throat> Political dealing that has to be uh, that has to go on, but but I think um, I think we're in pretty we're moving in the right direction yeah. for the most and part. And you end with you know your epilogue. It's about technique again. You know that is not what education's about, is it? The technique. Why don't you just read the last? You open by reading the opening paragraph. Right. Right? Why don't you read the last two paragraphs? Earlier you speak of what the okay. technique, the technique, and then here we go. Uh, by technique, we do not simply mean something technological. A computer, a jet plane, a videotape, they are the products of an advanced technology. But more than that, they represent a way of getting something done. And in that sense, they are like modular scheduling or team teaching or behavioral psychology or IQ tests. They are all designs for minimizing human effort and maximizing human achievement. But if you ask of a technique, what achievements are worth having? you can receive only two possible replies. One is that technique has nothing to say on the question. The other is even worse. It is that what is worth achieving is what the technique can best serve to achieve. In other words, if a method can do something, then it's worth doing. Do we have a new technique for teaching spelling? A new technique for teaching arithmetic to two-year-olds? A new technique for keeping school halls quiet? a new technique for measuring intelligence, then by all means, <clears throat> let's use them. That's what education is all about. But of course, that is not what education is all about. It is all about helping the young to become people who will be satisfactory to themselves and helpful to others. But what kind of person is that? What does it mean to be satisfactory to oneself?
or helpful to others? And what about love and good manners and respect for tradition? Where do they fit in? And who says anyone's intelligence should be measured? And where is it written that a two-year-old mathematician is worth having? Now these are questions that are worth a serious person's attention. They are questions too long neglected about where you stand and what you would like to believe in and what you think your children can reasonably become. They in no way concern technique, which may make them slightly un-American, but they are no less important for all that. And that's how the book ends, the school book. And it has what a friend of mine would call the feeling tone. And it's called The School Book. People want to know what the hollering is all about. My guest, Neil Postman, and he and his colleague, Charles Weingartner, did it. It's Delacorte Press, and it's beautiful. Thank you very much. And so are you. <laughs>